Thanks a lot for joining us uh, for this second urban AI conversation dedicated to the concept of AI localism. And for this conversation, we have the great pleasure and honor to have with us Stefan Verus and uh, Andrew Young. Hi, Stefan. Hi, Andrew. So uh, just to give you some elements of context be before to introduce you to, to Stefan and Andrew, uh, Urban AI is a think tank dedicated to the topic of urban artificial intelligence and urbanized technologies. And we are gathering a, a multidisciplinary and global community. And actually, Stefan uh, is part of, uh, of this community. And together, uh, we are doing some research, uh, writing some articles, doing some meetings, meetups, uh, around this uh, vast topic of uh, urban AI and trying to propose ethical modes of governance and sustain sustainable uses of this technology. And today we are going to explore this fascinating, con fascinating concept of AI localism with Stefan, who is the one who coined uh, this concept. So Stefan, um, you are the um, Chief of Research and Development at the Governance Lab. And actually you're also one of the co-founder of, uh, of this lab. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that uh, you're, you are going to tell us more about this lab, but it's from the, the, the NYU, New York University. And we also have with us uh, Andrew, uh, who is the Knowledge Director uh, at the Governance Lab. And so we will have 20 minutes of presentation from Stefan and Andrew on this topic of AI localism, and then 20 minutes of uh, exchange and conversations with all, with all, all of you. And if you already have some questions that you want to ask during the presentation, feel free to directly uh, write it on the chat or you or just keep it, keep it in mind and ask it uh, at, the, at the end. So Stefan and Andro now, the, the, right. the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Hubert, for having us and thanks everyone for uh, joining us. Uh, it's a delight to have you all here and uh, be able to share with you some early uh, reflections and more importantly, as uh, uh, Uber indicated, this is meant to be a conversation. So our hope is to really be brief, as brief as we can. And again, I warn you, uh, <laughs> being an academic, that is not always the easiest uh, to do. Um, but at the same time, really solicit your input whether, anyway, AI localism is indeed a phenomenon that we should understand more and better. And also to what extent can we steer it in a way that is beneficial to uh, society at large. And um, I've asked Andrew Young, who is the Knowledge Director of uh, GovLab to join, and uh, we will do some kind of tagging uh, on how we will present uh, as well. For those who don't know GovLab, we are an action research center indeed based here in New York. We are part of the engineering school of New York University and our mission is to really look into how do we transform the way we make decisions, i.e. make them more legitimate and effective at the same time, using new science and tools uh, and technologies. And uh, obviously that means also looking into how data and AI is being used for decision making, but also how does AI and data, um, how do we govern AI and data towards that end as well. And it is within that context that we started focusing on AI localism. Next slide, Andrew. Now, uh, this is obviously anyway a group that is already well aware of what's happening at the city level and indeed uh, worldwide, which is why Uber had the great foresight to actually create this dedicated think tank around urban AI. Worldwide, we see actually cities adopting and integrating the use of AI, whether it's for transportation, whether it's for transport uh, mobility, um, management, whether it's for um, um, uh, security, law enforcement, education, you name it. We see that cities worldwide are trying to consider what is the potential and value of AI in order to improve the way cities are operating. Now, obviously, as you can see from uh, the picture there with regard to facial recognition, there are also major challenges attached to that. And I think the real interesting question from our point of view, which is why we started focusing on AI localism, next slide, Andrew, is not only how are cities um, uh, integrating and using AI and how anyway, is AI uh, being applied within uh, a city context, it's uh, the interesting question from our point of view was also how is AI being governed 
within the local context. Because what we started uh, uh, witnessing, despite the fact that everyone is focusing on AI governance at the local, uh, at the global, and quite often at the national level, what we saw, what we saw is that actually cities are taking a leadership role, mainly because of a vacuum of AI governance. Uh, in the AI governance space. And so we thought that this was worth taking note. And we also noticed that this was somewhat similar to what we saw happening in other spaces, such as, for instance, privacy. Uh, because as you uh, might know, some cities worldwide have also taken a more leadership role with regard to privacy, which quite often is called privacy localism. Similar, we saw as it relates to broadband. Uh, worldwide, we see cities basically stepping up and trying to develop broadband solutions where the market fails, which is quite often called broadband localism. And so we thought that it might be useful to also anyway, look at what's happening at the AI governance space at the local level, which uh, Mona Sloan and myself coined AI localism. And so what we've tried to do beyond ultimately trying to advocate that we need to take stock and notice what's happening at the local level, mainly from an uh, innovation point of view, because I think cities are in a better position quite often to innovate how one regulates and governs AI because they are closer to the field. Um, we also try to actually uh, document what is happening because before we can study and understand what is happening, we obviously need to take stock. And this is what we've been trying to do uh, with our repository. And so the screenshot you see here is basically a screenshot of the repository that we are building, where we are trying to collect examples on how cities are stepping up or experimenting with approaches to AI governance in a variety of ways. Next slide. Um, what we have tried, and this is anyway, the article uh, with Mona Sloan, where anyway, I try to, Mona and myself try to basically say, well, uh, there is a new, a new phenomenon that we need to take stock that has promise, but also uh, clearly has challenges. And so that's where uh, we started using the term AI localism. Next slide. Now, based upon the repository and based upon the um, our current universe of examples on where cities and states or so localities um, have um, developed responses to AI, we have developed a canvas. Um, and this is anyway not the most uh, visual compelling uh, perspective of the canvas, but uh, what we would like to do during our short 20 minutes here is to really go through our can canvas of examples on how cities are developing approaches to AI governance. And it ranges from uh, provisions with regard to transparency, to procurement arrangements that uh, try to steer the procurement of AI uh, in a particular kind of fashion, to engagement with both citizens and um, uh, centers of AT within their uh, locality, to accountability, regulation, and ultimately also we see the emergence of principles. Um, and of course, urban AI has already contributed to that as well. Principles that seek to um, steer and inform how AI should be developed at the local level. And all this together is what we call the phenomenon of AI localism. And what we hope to do is not only describe it, but we will also, with all of your help, hopefully start to diagnose and subsequently inform what AI localism could and should be moving forward. But before we get there, and that should hopefully be the conversation, um, um, perhaps you can just surface a few of the examples of AI localism in action. And Andrew, why don't you get us uh, started with uh, some examples in the transparency space? Great, thanks Stefan. Um, so as Stefan indicated, the, the first element or first mode that we see in our canvas of AI localism is a move toward more transparency and how these systems are, are being operated and increasing the ability to um, have public oversight and knowledge of what, what kind of AI systems are in place at the city level. So just a couple of examples here among many that we've seen uh, popping up are uh, a new mandate in the city of Asheville, North Carolina, that requires a level of transparency on the use of automated systems of their impact for uh, broad uh, use and visibility. 
And then one of the more um, well-known examples that, that some of the folks on the call might be familiar with is uh, an AI registry in Helsinki um, that has a mandate to have every algorithm used by the city included in a registry, <clears throat> along with information on the data sets that were used to train the model, uh, how the algorithm is actually used in practice, how humans actually leverage the prediction and, and um, insights derived from the, the algorithms to inform their practices and how those algorithms are assessed for potential bias and risks. So those are just two of a, a number of different examples that, that have been uh, generated recently. Um, and within the transparency space, you know, in looking at our repository and the current field of practice, we identified a few and questions or reflections that we might want to pick up during the discussion portion of this session, but we'll just throw these on the table for now and then eager to, to dive in whenever we get um, through our initial presentation here. But as it relates to transparency around AI local AI systems or transparency as a model of AI localism, some of the questions that are top of mind for us are what do we do about black box methodologies and how do you enable some kind of transparency around those uh, types of efforts? how to establish transparency across the data and AI life cycle. Uh, in much of our work, we focus on how these types of AI and data systems exist on a life cycle and thinking about the sequential elements and how risks and opportunities emerge over time. How do we establish transparency across that life cycle rather than just at the start or at the end, um, for example, and then how to retain a level of openness when working with the private sector around AI, especially as it relates to things like trade secrets that might um, slow moves toward transparency when you're working with the private sector as opposed to the public sector. Um, so those are just a few of the, the questions and reflections for the transparency space. But again, we'll dive into those um, in more detail, hopefully in the, in the um, discussion portion of the, the session today. So I will hand it back to you, uh, Stefan. Thanks. To Thanks. So the second area, in addition to uh, increased transparency uh, methodologies and also attempts to be transparent as it relates to AI, we also see that several cities have uh, tried to uh, establish uh, and use procurement as a way to actually govern AI. And I think that's in itself kind of an interesting governance methodology that quite often gets ignored in the larger ecosystem of governance. But here are just two examples, again, on how, on the one hand, the city of Berkeley and on the other hand, the Detroit Council are using procurement in order to um, basically steer and establish uh, transparency, but also accountability in, for instance, the use of surveillance cameras and uh, associated analytics. And, uh, uh, and the same uh, for the one in uh, Berkeley. So that's another example of AI localism in action. Next slide. And here, anyway, some of the reflections is, of course, anyway, how do we actually trans demonstrate transparency of spending? And I think it's interesting, like, for instance, Anna is on the call today as well, which is, anyway, and, and I think what was great in some of Anna's work is really not just understanding what is the use of AI, but also how much do we actually spend on AI and who is spending on AI and how does that actually translate into certain kinds of practices and who are are actually the ones receiving the funds to develop AI as well. And I think that's in itself where cities can take a, a leadership role in actually making more transparent, but also then anyway, procuring and using procurement as a governance tool as well. Next, uh, Andrew. Great, and then uh, we see a number of different approaches to engagement as a model for AI localism and improving governance around AI systems. So the GovLab and UNESCO, uh, for example, have organized public deliberations and dialogues around responsible uses of data and AI to inform practice and decision-making among stakeholders that are involved in these types of systems. Uh, in the public and the private sectors. So those new forms of kind of public deliberation models as a form of engagement. Um, and then we also see universities and research centers increasingly driving this type of engagement um, through things like expert research clinics, the establishment of new institutes that really focus on engaging stakeholders to better understand how to guide these practices in a responsible way and other forms of, of kind of research driven engagement where universities are, are staking out this leadership role. Um, and then as it relates to, to engagement questions or reflections uh, on the citizen front, really thinking about how 
segments of the population, um, enabling governments to actually be more inclusive and representative in how they go about their engagement efforts on these issues, um, preventing capture of certain processes uh, by certain interest groups that might have a particular type of agenda that could kind of, uh, push the engagements or deliberations in certain ways that might not be organic and, and representative of broader kind of perspectives. Then when thinking about engagement from a civil society and academia perspective, how do those players, um, how can they play a role to ensure that voices that aren't traditionally included in these kind of deliberations have a seat at the table? So representing um, those other perspectives that might be harder to engage in a broad you know, public engagement efforts. And then thinking about key steps going forward, uh, conducting the type of stakeholder mapping and impact assessments that can really inform and help to organize uh, these types of engagements in a useful way are one element that we, we think would be valuable, as well as really thinking about how do you design different scenarios um, as a means for, again, organizing these discussions in a tangible way. So focusing on real types of practice rather than broad or abstract kind of notions of AI and governance, really getting into uh, very specific types of scenarios that people can think about and uh, engage with in a way that can better allow for measurement and identification of their expectations, perspectives, and, and kind of needs going forward. And back to you, Stefan. Thanks. The other uh, big area, of course, of uh, AI governance at the city level has, has been the creation of new kinds of accountability and oversight mechanisms. It's not just about transparency, it's also about how do we then instigate some accountability. And so we've had a whole range of, uh, and again, all the examples that we discussed uh, today are also on the repository. So it's uh, um, you can find more there as well. But with regard to accountability, of course, here in New York, we have uh, had the Automated Decision Systems Task Force. And in Seattle, for instance, we had the Surveillance Advisory Working Group. And we see that many cities are actually establishing those kinds of oversight committees to inform, but also to steer the use. Now, clearly, uh, like for instance, in New York City, there was a lot of discussion about open washing uh, that the anyway the systems task force was established, but basically had no access to uh, uh, nor uh, understanding on what was really happening. And so the key question is, of course, is to what extent is this accountability theater or to what extent is there a serious effort at the city level to really instigate oversight and accountability? But at least it's worth noting that um, those efforts are taking place and that cities are experimenting with new kinds of accountability systems. Next slide, um, Andrew. We also, anyway, seen the creation of new functions. Uh, here again in New York, we have the Algorithms Management and Policy Officer, right, which is a, a kind of a new function that didn't exist before. And uh, we've seen in other cities also where actually new kinds of functions are being established to oversee the use of AI uh, for decision making as well. Next slide. Now, the key uh, question here is, of course, to what extent is oversight distributed? How is it actually connected with the decision process? Because we see a lot of those, for instance, task forces and committees are being set up but are really anyway standalone kind of efforts and so don't really have that kind of impact and also anyway what happens if something goes wrong is there uh, actually any kind of enforcement uh, mechanisms in place or do we need to engage judiciary in a more uh, effective manner and that by the way is also something that we will see later on is that the judiciary is also stepping up more and more within the context of cities to actually establish oversight with regard to certain kinds of practices. And I think that's also worth noting and quite often ignored is the role of actually judiciary at the city level. Next, uh, Andrew. Great, and then the next element of the canvas is this uh, focus on regulation. And we see in a number of cities uh, regulations that ban the use of facial recognition technology in particular, uh, cities can deem the risks outweigh the potential value, especially as it relates to uses by the police or other types of enforcement mechanisms for uh, facial recognition technologies. But we do see uh, regulation kind of coming into play for other types of AI use case, whether it be you know, AI use writ large, as we see in Shenzhen, um, or more specific types more specific forms of AI or particular types of use cases, um, as we see in New York with um, uh, 
increasing regulation around biometric use in an AI type of environment. Um, in terms of some of the, the reflections or considerations for regulation, um, thinking about the timing, when do the do laws and policies, uh, should they come before or after the implementation of AI? So is it reactive or kind of proactive type of regulations? Um, should, and if so, uh, how can governments include citizens in legislation drafting? At GovLab, we do a lot of work on this concept of crowd law and more participatory means for uh, developing legislation and constitutions. Is there a way to take that type of approach in um, the, the creation of regulation in this space? Um, and, you know, again, getting into that question of public versus private, how uh, do regulations impact government sanctioned AI versus private sector led type of AI initiatives? And how do we think about those issues? And then finally, um, how do we ensure that there is a level of capacity or competency among lawmakers and the judiciary to ensure that provisions and interpretations are appropriate and likely to have a positive impact on the responsible use of AI in, in cities? Right, and all those um, initiatives, whether it's transparency, oversight, procurement, um, engagement, quite often are informed or lead to quite often the development of distinctive principles or notions of rights as it relates to AI. And I think uh, what is interesting is also, and again, uh, from you know, at least a, a development point of view, is that many cities are joining up in order to express a, a, a common set of principles on the use of AI, which is like AI localism uh, at the, anyway, across borders. And so here are just again a few examples when there's city digital rights that connect cities ranging from Barcelona, Amsterdam to London, I would say quite often the usual suspects. Uh, and I think some of those are on the call today as well, uh, that really take a leadership role in actually uh, carving out um, principles as it relates to uh, digital rights or rights that are applicable to AI. And similar, of course, London has also developed this technology charter that really spells out what are some of the principles, goals, and rights that they want to apply across technology, including AI. Next slide. And again, same for other uh, places. Uh, I mean, we had uh, also Barcelona uh, and the Barcelona Declaration, and then we have the Declaration of course, also coming out of Montreal that seeks to uh, inform um, how AI is being developed and designed at the local level, which is again, a clear example of AI localism uh, in practice. Next slide. Now, some of the considerations or at least reflections, and again, there are of course many more that we need to uh, use in order to make uh, a better diagnosis and go beyond description. But the question quite often is, do we actually need a new set of principles, right? And, or do we just uh, apply human rights? And then anyway, to what extent can cities actually develop human rights uh, uh, in a way that nations typically uh, or global organizations typically are enforced to do? How do you combine principles with then anyway, cost benefit assessments? How do we not only be principled, but also practical <laughs> quite often. Uh, how do you translate those principles in uh, practice and, uh, and how do you enforce them? All kinds of questions that uh, remain still quite often open, uh, given the fact that AR localism is an emerging field, but I think these are questions worth uh, considering. Next slide. And so from our point of view, the real interest uh, as it relates to AI localism is the question whether cities are actually laboratories uh, of AI governance. As you know, there's a well-established um, uh, perspective that cities are quite often laboratories of democracy and, uh, and really are at the foreground uh, of uh, experimenting new ways of governing, regulating, and uh, policing, for instance, as certain kinds of technologies. And so from our point of view, the interesting question here is, is AR localism an example of innovation? And do we see more innovation at the local level than what we see at the national level? And so the pros of AI governance or AR localism is obviously that it's quite often filling a void, meaning there's no shortage of AI strategies quite often at the national level, but they quite often don't really govern AI. They basically steer the development and the investment of AI, but quite often governance is absent. Although we see more and more at the European level and others, of course, 
uh, organizations stepping up at the same time. I think uh, cities um, are still filling the void of actually guidance as it relates to the development of technology. Other pros of AI localism is that it's immediacy, right? We have much rapid feedback loops uh, on, uh, at the local level so that we know whether something works or doesn't work and what uh, some of the harms or benefits might be of certain kinds of innovations and also much closer to communities. So we have a much stronger community empowerment opportunity to engage them in the development of AI governments. Now, the cons is of course massive fragmentation, right? Potential for massive fragmentation. If every city are developing their, a their own AI um, governance approach, and we see this already happening in facial recognition, for instance, then obviously, anyway, we see kind of a, a, an increased complexity and fragmentation as it relates to AI governance, and that could be good or it could be bad, right? So I think uh, that's something to be considered. Also, what we see, of course, given the fact that quite often capacity and capture go hand in hand, right? Limited capacity to um, basically understand what really is happening and what needs to be done quite often leads to opportunities for capture, sometimes by the private sector, sometimes by public uh, interest organizations as well. Right? And I think uh, uh, we need to be aware of the potential for capture here. And then lastly, it's not like, anyway, quite often cities are perceived as uh, havens of uh, civilization and, uh, uh, and public deliberation, but obviously cities have their own challenges with regard to quite often politics. And it's not that because it's at cities, sometimes politics of within cities can also be more what we call dark municipalism, municipalism, where you actually have some kind of, anyway, the old man's club making decisions uh, uh, or anyway, politics uh, basically dominating uh, sound governance. And so we need to be aware that this obviously is still part of reality and also can inform and impact AI localism. Now, moving forward, Andrew. Great. Um, so moving forward, we're really eager at GovLab and would argue that the field at large could work toward increasing our understanding and insight on uh, five key elements. The first is focused on the conceptual elements of AI localism and in particular, the concept of localism in particular and the other related fields that Stefan had mentioned. So how can we really gain a deeper understanding, a more operational understanding of the affordances of localism and how that might impact AI localism going forward? Um, really thinking about how we can be more descriptive and comparative as it relates to current experiments and interventions around AI localism. So continuing to build out that repository that we've been developing and that evidence base around what, um, what is actually being deployed and what current practice is. And then relatedly moving toward more of a diagnostic of what works in practice and what the real impacts, the realized impacts of existing work in the AI localism space might be. So how do we move toward more of that diagnostic understanding and ultimately moving toward more predictive um, capacities around understanding trends and developments in the AI localism space, as well as other related spaces, including you know, national level AI initiatives and other new developments that might help us predict more effectively where things are, are moving going ahead. And then finally, being becoming more prescriptive um, and leveraging all of this insight and evidence and existing practice to establish uh, new and fit for purpose guidelines for cities and other localities um, to help them harness the, the benefits and avoid the cons of a, an AI localism type of approach. So those are some of the areas of future research. Stefan, I don't know if you want to briefly reflect on some of the oh, I think, um, that's, projects um, we have going on. That's, uh, yeah, that's basically our whirlwind of current reflections. And of course, anyway, uh, we didn't want to take the full 45 minutes to uh, report back. But I think, um, anyway, the key message here from my point of view is that AI localism is happening. I think we need to take stock and uh, we also need to really, as a community, document what is happening in order to complement what is happening at the national level. In most observatories with regard to AI policies and AI governance are mainly and solely focused on what's happening at the national level and are really missing what is happening at the local level where, as we have identified, some real interesting developments are taking place. Whether or not they are anyway, um, um, going into the right direction, I think at the moment 
our main effort has been to be descriptive so that we actually get a hold of what is happening beyond and before we become prescriptive. And um, I think uh, we are eager to a, learn more about other examples of uh, AI localism. Uh, feel free to contribute to the repository. Feel free to suggest collaborations on uh, potential areas of work or joint uh, writing uh, exercises within the context of urban AI, for instance, Hubert would be, uh, uh, would be delighted as well. But uh, before we go there, eager to hear whether any of that resonates or whether um, anyway, we are focusing on something that <laughs> might not be worthwhile, although I doubt it that within the context of urban AI, this might be um, uh, a consideration. Thanks a lot, Stefan and uh, Andrew, for, for this super insightful and interesting uh, presentation. If you want to contribute, we have the link of the AI localism repository in the chat. So basically right now you can ask your question by taking like just asking your question like this. If you are more shy, you can also just post your, your question um, in, uh, in the chat. And actually, I have a, I have a question, uh, uh, Stefan and Andrew, because you, you talked uh, and compared the cities as uh, labor laboratories of AI governance. And I was wondering, like for you, um, which cities, which laboratories are the most mature, most advanced on this topic of AI localism and why? Yes, thanks, Hubert. And this is uh, a typical uh, question that I uh, refuse to answer on <laughs> uh, because uh, I might make enemies here. But the um, but I think the question is, of course, what's maturity, right? And I think uh, 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 I think we are all basically on a, a scale of learning and um, experimentation, from my point of view, as it relates to AI and as it relates to AI governance. And uh, obviously there are a few cities that have undergone, such as, for instance, the city where Andrew and I are based, uh, i.e. New York, where, where there has been some um, anyway, initiatives ranging from the task force to, anyway, as you know, last week, the release of the AI strategy. Um, that uh, anyway, that indicate that uh, of course they are trying to get hold and uh, uh, get to grips with the issues. Does this mean that they have figured it out? I would uh, strongly uh, uh, argue that they are still in a learning uh, curve with regard to how to do this. Um, but because cities like New York or other cities quite often have a more vocal, quite often um, civil society, they're quite often forced to actually take a stance. And I think that's one element, uh, perhaps Hubert, as you, anyway, you asked me to reflect on conditions, the fact that anyway, there is more awareness of the potential harm of AI and benefit from that matter um, uh, within cities like New York or Barcelona uh, or Helsinki for that matter, um, uh, or Paris for that matter, that uh, um, city officials quite often are anyway called upon to actually reflect on that. In other cities, uh, there might, this might all happen under the radar and, uh, and uh, mainly because there is this, not this kind of civil society uh, demand. The other aspect is of course, is that many cities anyway, do have uh, investment and are more sophisticated at the technology level. And as a, re a result, understand also the potential and harm as well. But, but those are, that's a really good question, Hubert. And that's what we meant by our, anyway, we need to do a lot more diagnostic work. But I'm always a little bit worried about jumping into diagnostic and judgmental before we actually get a hold of what's happening. And so our current effort has really been to hold back <laughs> from uh, being judgmental, but really trying to say, take a moment and there is something happening here and we need to really start documenting it. And then also trying to actually, our canvas is trying to provide a frame to categorize what is happening, right? We see something about transparency, we see something in procurement, we see something in uh, engagement models. And I think um, um, eventually that might lead to an understanding how cities can actually govern and what are the, what's the mix of tools that they should consider but um, I think at the moment we are still in the collection phase and, um, and I think it's kind of early days to do that kind of judgment uh, because we are all learning. Andrew, I don't know, did I? 
do you agree or disagree with that? I think that that resonates with me for sure. Thank you. And then I see there's a question in the chat as well. Yes, uh, someone is asking um, in the link above, uh, I saw information about Capton's integrated development plans. Is there someone I can, make, I, can make, I can make contact with in this regard? Stefan, Andrew, do you know uh, someone? We can, we can look this? into it. We can look into it and uh, uh, I mean, send us an email or uh, via either LinkedIn or directly and um, we, will, uh, we will try to connect you. Thanks, Afid. I saw that you open your camera. Do you have like a question? We, I think we can't uh, hear you, uh, Afid. Well, you can like this, maybe. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was saying sorry, I, I arrived a bit late, but uh, uh, I, I've read about uh, uh, the, the repository through Uber and I think it's very interesting. Uh, for the context, I'm, I'm working in the metropolitan government in the north of France, in the city of Lille, metropolitan area of Lille. And um, in, in France, we have uh, recently a law that uh, has been uh, well, passed to to make us publish algorithms that take uh, decisions on, on individuals that automatically treat data. So we are just starting this, this process and it's very interesting because it's, it will, it's not necessarily uh, algorithms with AI, but it will lead us to question algorithms and then I think AI and I think it's a very interesting moment to start working on repository of algorithms at large, not only related with AI because it already asks a lot of questions and then we'll be able to, to deep dive into AI with also citizens uh, in, in the same way we had the, the wave of open data. I think we are having a moment with open algorithms and I think uh, it will be very interesting uh, here and uh, it's just the beginning. We, we don't really know how to how to do it concretely, but I think it will be very interesting. And in the to also answer the the, the cons of of um, fragmentation uh, on AI localism. Right now, I'm also working with an association that in France that is called the the Fing, uh, working to to think a new way of uh, working with the digital tools. And the the goal is to create coalitions. Uh, between cities and private actors to to do pretty much what you're what you're doing i think which is have try to uh, set on a common ground on a common diagnostic and and uh, and and uh, and list uh, some first good practices i don't know if the term good practices is, is to be used but uh, good practices around um, a better use of ai so uh, I think if we if we are to to build something more con more uh, yeah more uh, yeah if we have to build some tools uh, we'd be happy to connect with you maybe to 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 put it on this repository because it would be it would be our ambition to really have uh, something uh, that might help guidelines really in the prescript prescriptive uh, sorry um, uh, alignment of your work uh, I think that would be very interesting to. To connect on these points. No, that would be great, uh, Hafid, and 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 yes, uh, th that's the kind of input that we are at the moment really looking for, which is really anyway what's happening out there. Because anyway, we are kind of here anyway, parochially <laughs> based in New York, and uh, uh, and and obviously we try to have a, a broad uh, net of uh, data collection. But those kinds of examples, and I, I do like also your example of open algorithm, which is indeed, anyway, it's not only about preventing things, it's also about promoting things, right? What we see happening at the cities. And so promoting open algorithms, promoting actually the availability of models that um, can be repurposed, I think is a, is a positive uh, an important um, um, governance uh, uh, approach to to AI, 
that uh, indeed uh, we should add to the uh, to the to the canvas as well. And now you're you're raising your your hand, so yes, please feel free. ask a question. Yes, please feel free to ask. Hi. Um, uh, thank you so much for that really wonderful and rich presentation, Stefan and Andrew. I really uh, enjoyed it. And you, you had so many questions. So I'm trying to focus to see what to exactly ask. So just a few thoughts first. Um, I'm starting my PhD research. This is month two, I guess. Uh, so looking at why do governance models of AI include public and private and why should we watch them? So really looking at, um, sorry, my cat's here. Um, if, if AI is being deployed to automatically govern us, then research should assess who governs AI and how it is being governed. Um, and something that my supervisor, Renee Sieber, um, likes is a phrase that I will be looking at to explore AI, AI governance as comforting the comfortable and afflicting the afflicted. So that's a lot to do with uh, principles and declarations and sometimes um, AIA's um, algorithmic impact assessments and how they've been um, deployed or, you know, designed and uh, implemented. Um, but going back to AI localism, which I really like as a way forward in more responsible AI, um, but also addressing kind of like how AI municipalities are using AI. So in Canada so far, they've done a lot of in-house building, so they don't really procure to vendors yet, or they are just now working on their procurement policies around AI. Um, but as we know, there's other departments like law enforcement who have been using AI or biometrics forever. Um, and so how could like AI localism address these sort of systemic problems? And you know, across the US, you see that wave of facial recognition technology bans. Um, can we bring that to other countries or, and cities around the world, um, but also use it as a, as a point to take it forward in changing legislation and also just saying no to, to how maybe departments that are untouchable like law enforcement do things because um, as I, you know, I've been in open data for a long time, that's always the kind of thing where you cannot get that access. You cannot get public data from those, like from them or from departments of defense across the world and so on. But usually that's where a lot of these potential harms and existing harms do happen. Um, I mean, that will be a part of what I will be looking at, but I'm interested to see if you can take that forward in AI governance at the local level and see how that can then impact what happens at the national level um, and what you think about something like AIAs for AI localism, but maybe uh, something that's revamped because so far as in the Canadian context, there's not really any, um, it's, it's like a nice to have, it's a voluntary thing. You don't need to, um, you, need, you don't need to commit to it if you're a vendor and also it doesn't, it, it, there's no consequences if you don't do it, if something goes wrong necessarily. So I'm just curious more about that oversight, but also the, the consequences around harm um, and what you have, what you propose or what you have planned in, uh, in tackling that kind of longer, long-term challenge. Yeah, no, I think uh, these are very interesting questions and uh, congratulations, um, Anna, with your two-month uh, uh, PhD uh, work already. Um, um, I think um, you already made tremendous progress in two months uh, based upon the questions here. But the um, but I think these are very important questions. And again, I have no particular answers except for saying is that we do need to indeed focus more on the political economy in which AI governance uh, is established. And for instance, as it relates to um, use of AI uh, for law enforcement purposes, uh, as you know, it's very interesting to see to what extent the, um, how would I say it, the, 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 the power position that law, law enforcement has within uh, city government um, will determine to what extent there is a willingness for openness with regard to certain kinds of uh, practices. And, uh, and that turned out to be a, 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 you know, not a city to be named, but when, anyway, that was listed <laughs> in the examples, that turned out to be a real problem here um, with regard to openness of, for instance, uh, algorithms uh, within 
uh, law enforcement was because anyway, law enforcement basically had to had the veto right to uh, uh, within uh, governance mechanisms to actually stop any uh, query and any kind of uh, consideration. Now, um, again, there are clear, and they do that probably for clear public interest purposes. So it's not always anyway from bad intent, right? But I think uh, uh, we really need to understand those kinds of dynamics uh, more for sure. And indeed, um, what we also, and that's something also that is kind of, which we didn't mention at the, um, at the AR localism kind of pros and cons is that uh, in some cases, um, cities have no enforcement opportunities and it's really national, right? And so the interesting thing is going to be to what extent do localities work with the national in order to actually enforce certain kinds of policies and how do they anyway, sync up? The other interesting thing, Anna, from your conversation or your questions is to really thinking about, anyway, how, do, how does transfer of the policies happen across cities? And are there certain cities being perceived as model cities <laughs> and, and which model cities by which uh, cities, right? Because some cities might be seen as that everything but what happens in New York or everything that happens in New York. And you have that kind of, anyway, uh, dynamic with regard to certain cities positioning themselves to other model cities. And I think uh, the interesting thing will be, does this happen also in the AI governance space as well? We have two more questions. Um, one from Stefan, who is asking, um, are there good examples of using AI to create synthetic open data set at an individual level across cities? Um, meaning that's something, I mean, frankly, I, I, I'm gonna have to look into that. I mean, I'm aware of, again, being parochial here in New York. <laughs> of uh, uh, New York doing some work in that space. There are other, I think, Canadian uh, um, cities like Toronto, for instance, that have also experimented uh, um, with that. Um, but um, um, I will have to look into that uh, to more in more detail to be able to give you a sophisticated answer. But it's an important question, yeah. So Stefan, if you want, you can uh, give us your email or directly ask Stefan or on uh, on uh, on LinkedIn, uh, I suppose. Uh, yes, and we also have another question from Luca, who is asking: Do we have examples of AI urban projects in developing South cities, particularly in South Southeast Asia, where urban challenges are concentrated and population highly connected to technology technological tools? Um, the short answer is yes, we do, but uh, the longer answer is that we see quite a lot more activity in North America and in Europe and Central Asia, at least in our repository to date. And I think you know, we'd be the last to say that it's a perfect and fully representative sample of AI localism interventions, but based on our research over recent months, we've seen quite a lot of clustering um, of practice in North America and, and Europe. Um, but we do see more and more, especially in East Asia and the Pacific, more activity. So that's going to be third most uh, well-represented region in our uh, repository. But then whenever you get into other regions like the Middle East and North Africa, um, Latin America and the Caribbean and Sub-Saharan Africa, it seems that we're still in very early days of these types of interventions. But there are some uh, notable first movers. Yeah, and I would add a lot of this um, is also connected with the narrative of smart cities in uh, uh, certain uh, areas. And here we see there's no shortage of smart city plans quite often, but uh, we don't include those because they don't really touch on any of the governance questions <laughs> that are uh, that from our point are important. So there's no shortage of anyway, smart city strategies, but then there is no governance really of the technologies uh, embedded in those strategies. And so... Uh, but again, uh, we might miss something. And so, Lucas, if you have any uh, suggestions uh, and any uh, insights, feel free to share it uh, with us as well. Yeah, I, I was wondering uh, in regard of uh, Andrew and Spurs that uh, maybe if uh, several cities in Asia are not documenting uh, this repository, maybe this, this is not because they are not using AI, but because 
they are not as concerned uh, uh, maybe uh, in in this uh, AI governance topics than other uh, cities that, as you said, have uh, more pressures from citizens, people, uh, so society, etc. Absolutely, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, I think that's probably worth kind of reiterating that the repository isn't a collection of AI use cases at the city level. It's it's really about that governance component. So whenever we see a dearth of kind of governance interventions in the repository. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a dearth of AI implementations uh, for better or worse. So that's just in terms of what is or is not represented in the repository. I think that's, that's a great point there. I, I don't know if there's the time for a small last, last question. Um, uh, also, I, I don't know if you worked uh, with or on the, um, the the creation of this algorithms management and policy uh, officer position in, in in New York, but uh, I was uh, wondering um, I don't know since when it exists, and I I was wondering if you had already some conclusions on how it is important to have maybe this kind of position to better govern AI at the local level. For example, for me and my metro, should, should I uh, suggest that we create this job here in in my metropolitan government or do you think if we have something someone on data uh, it is enough it can it can evolve from that or is it a specific topic a specific team that has to be um, developed on that with specific skills uh, for my part I, I come from sociology and political science so I, I think maybe that's also the kind of um, background that is also interesting in this maybe too often technical uh, uh, world. Yeah, no, I think uh, it's a good question, and it remains to be have it remains to be seen what the value ultimately is of that kind of position. But I do think a few reflections. One, I think it is good to have a point of contact and point of accountability, uh, because too often, anyway, especially as it relates to new technologies, everyone is pointing at each other. And as a result, you really don't know who is actually accountable or who should be engaged in certain kinds of conversations. Secondly, the um, a key across many city governments, of course, a key function is coordination, because it's not like anyway AI touches on anyway almost every or could touch on every aspect across city government, right? From sanitation to law enforcement and parks in between, and uh, uh, and I think um, having anyway. Um, having no coordination on how AI is used and governed across the city agencies, I think is quite often uh, a challenge if there's no coordination or a, a point of coordination. So quite often the officer has an internal function in addition to an external function, right? External as in the point of contact with the wider world, but internal also actually knowing what's going on and happening. And then of course, anyway, I think Governance is not only, as I try to explain, is not only preventing misuse, right? Uh, it also is actually promoting uh, use to improve government and improve the city. And I think uh, having an individual that understands both, I think is, uh, is a key, or a team for that matter, is a key uh, element because uh, I think the hard part of governing is exactly is that AI anyway has potential uh, massive potential in certain areas, uh, but also has massive potential to do harm. And how do you go about this in a uh, more sophisticated way? And that's where a distinctive function might actually help to understand the, and in a granular way, understand the potential and the limits and harm uh, uh, potential here. And so that's where I think if it would be another, anyway, combine that with the chief data officer, for instance, or the chief technology officer, I mean, that might... Um, might get the the the, the attention, but um, but it's always going to compete with other anyway aspects as well, and so that's why. Now, the, typically, of course, anyway, the potential for a, a function like that depends quite often on the size of a uh, a city, right? Because typically we are focusing on kind of larger cities, which is why I think a shared service or a shared accountability structure across cities is going to become more important and interesting as well. And uh, we're probably going to see more of that as well. And again, Hafid, you already referred to some of those developments in France as well. So thanks. Thank you.
Great, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Stefan and Andrew, for your presentation, for taking the, for taking the time also to answer uh, all these questions. Thanks to all of you for attending this session and for your questions. Again, uh, if you want to document the AI localism repository, you have uh, the link on our chat. Uh, and on our side, we will have our next urban AI conversation in two weeks with Rafael Luna. The station is now in the chat. Uh, Rafael Luna, who is professor at Adyong University in South Korea and the co-founder of Fraud. And uh, the name of his session is Beyond the Third Space. Uh, so you will see in few uh, in few days on our LinkedIn and Twitter what it means to be uh, beyond the third space. <laughs> Bye.